Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me and sharing me on social media is uh, actually really important. I uh, am a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising, so social media is the way that I grow. So please follow me on Twitter at SYLTales and any other social media. I am on every social media known to man. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, since you came to this video looking for a review, I have to assume that you've already watched Batwoman Season 1, Episode 11, an unbirthday present. So, that being the case, I will still, just for safety's sake, issue a... Spoiler alert! Spoiler alert! All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers! Yes, it is a spoiler alert, and that is because I am a fan die master, and that means that the fandom is strong with me, and that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about half an hour too early. This is not a boast or a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the century that came before, and you find out there's not very much that's new in the world, and it often interferes with your ability to enjoy things. And boy, is that always true with a Batwoman. So, well, here we are again. That was literally the first thing that I said after watching this episode. I was watching it in my bed because I have um, two shows that I review on Sundays, Doctor Who and Batwoman. And just one of them can kind of make my back hurt, both from sitting and doing the, you know, the script and then sitting here and recording it because I have to, you know, Alexander up and be up straight to some extent. So it does, does sometimes hurt my back. So I was watching in bed. And, you know, instead of on my big 42-inch monitor in front of me here, and um, I was watching it on my phone, so I crawled out of bed just as it finished airing, and I said, well, here we go again. And that just tumbled right off of my lips. I guess you can say that it wasn't as stupid as last week, but when you have a story from last week whose ultimate message is, if you're gay, you don't get prosecuted for... 450 counts of attempted mass murder, the extortion of about 7 million people, and credit card fraud. When you don't have that story, almost anything is better. So it wasn't that dumb, but it was still predictable. It was still dumb. Really, really predictable and really, really dumb. And I don't think this is because I'm a fan die master. I think it's because the show is really, really dumb and predictable. Once we were given last week's cliffhanger, it was pretty obvious where this was going. Beth is some is alive and throw away some kind of a pizza flotsam that is now on the new Earth Prime universe, inexplicably um, from a parallel universe in which Kate saved her from the accident that killed her mother. You know, you could have just done that last week. We all knew. So, I usually like to start out by saying something good about an episode. I usually like to talk about the great moments. Well, there aren't any. The best I could come up with were okay moments. That is part of what happens in the story that makes at least some level of sense. Now, I wasn't always jarred by the soap opera drama, and I usually am on this show. With two exceptions. It really didn't bother me otherwise. They made some level of sense because they dealt with the fact of Beth's existence. Now, another okay moment <laughs> is uh, when the car didn't explode after it was catching fire. I was, thought that was good. At least they, you know, I was kind of expecting it to. At least they do know just enough science to know that exploding cars is really rare. Also, an okay moment, I kind of assumed that uh, Alice would, or someone, or Mouse, would kill Beth by the end of the episode, and they came close, but they didn't. 
However, I expect them to kill Beth in the next episode or sometime very soon. Since only one of them can live, we know now from the previews, I expect there to be only one alive, and there's going to be a scene between Beth and Alice where Alice puts one in Beth's head and two in her chest. Beth is going to die at some point, and we all know it. And that is it for the okay moments. There was nothing else. Even, you know, the remotely, there was nothing even remotely good about any of the rest of the episode. Got a lot of cringe moments, as you might expect, from something this stupid and predictable. So my cringe moments. My biggest cringe moment actually had more to do, nothing to do with the episode, but actually the commercials. You see, I was in IIT for 40 years, and during that time, I acquired a particular set of skills. One of these allows me to watch any TV show or movie that I like online for free and totally free of commercials. Now, I watch both Doctor Who and Batwoman live as they air, and Doctor Who on BBC One does not have commercials. But Batwoman, Jesus, tap dancing Christ, how do people deal with this crap? There were numerous commercial breaks during which I counted anywhere between 8 and 12 commercials ranging from 30 to 60 seconds long. No wonder these episodes are only 40 minutes long or less. I, how do normal people deal with this crap? I, I've been gotten out of not watching commercials for so long. How do people deal with this junk? Then there was the out of place soap opera drama. Sophie. <laughs> Trying to bond with Alice was just stupid. You've got three to four hostages. It is time to get the biggest, baddest SOB the crows have to soften Alice up a bit and then clamp the electrodes to her genitalia and run up the current. Oh, trust me, unlike James Bond, everybody breaks when enough brute force is used. I'm pretty sure that the crows wouldn't mind and the GCPD doesn't seem to mind at all. The phrase, she became violent, or she tried to escape, immediately comes to mind as possible ways you could cover yourselves. If you really want to be rid of her for good, then when you've decided to transfer her someplace, take her out back and just snuff her. Nobody will care if you saved the citizens of Gotham City the cost of a trial. The other out-of-place soap opera was when Beth is being made up to look like Alice. They were under a time crunch, okay? They didn't have time to for a confab between Beth and Mary. Just put the wig on, get her out. Done. Other cringe moments. Nobody but Kate remembers Beth in this universe. So what then happened when she was headed back to the university last week? There would have been no one who recognized her. Surely Beth would have noticed this little factoid when interacting with what she thought were friends or instructors. I mean, she didn't walk in there alone, right, and do nothing. She went in there for a reason, and people must have been involved. And since nobody remembers Beth, how can she show her face on the street? Alice is like Gotham City's number one on the most wanted list. Do they expect brown hair to throw the GCPD or the crows off the scent? Beth's got the exact same fingerprints and the exact same DNA as Alice. Good old Slam Bradley is going to see her on the street and arrest her. And they'll find that she's an exact match for Alice except for her hair color. So what are they going to do? Keep Beth locked in a room in Wayne Enterprises building for the rest of her life? As with last week, one has to wonder why the Crows have Alice in custody rather than the GCPD. The Crows' commander is in jail for multiple murders. The Crows should be thoroughly disgraced, hemorrhaging clients by the dozens. They are absolutely, they have zero accountability at this point. And besides, every time the Crows have had Alice in custody, she escapes. Wouldn't it be a hell of a lot safer to have her cooling her jets in a GCPD jail cell in the basement awaiting a transfer to Arkham? By the way, how does the criminal justice system work in Gotham City? See, in the real world, Beth would be arrested, arraigned, held without any bond whatsoever, and then tried. Assuming that she copped an insanity plea, which I assume must be a good possibility here, 
Only then would she be then committed to a mental institution. Now, no doubt the GCPD would have 10 guards just making sure that she didn't escape en route, unlike the crows, who have always let her escape while in their custody. And in the real world, the GCPD would get Alice a cavity search every single time they took her anywhere, not to mention assigning an army of cops with shotguns any time they moved her. No doubt the GCPD would never entertain the thought of setting her free. Unfortunately, this time around, neither did the Groves. It's just that she easily got away. Again. In any case, this would not be necessary if Batwoman hadn't done the right thing on about episode one or episode three, episode four, all of the many, many times that she has had occasion to apprehend Alice. If she'd actually done it, well, none of this would have happened. Instead, Batwoman has become an accessory to every single crime that Alice has committed, including the multiple murders. Did they really think that they could pass Beth off as a madwoman? Seriously? I mean, that kind of psychosis is really hard for an actor to play, and Beth is a nuclear physicist or something. Another moment. Alice learning how to do surgery at the tender age of 13. I'm sorry. She may have hands capable of knitting a sweater, but this in no way qualifies her as a surgeon. Another moment. Why didn't Alice spill the beans to the crow about Kate being Batwoman? The entire point of the last episode was that Alice wanted Kate to be unmasked. That would have been like the first thing to come out of Alice's mouth, except, of course, that the motivations for these characters change like every five to ten minutes. Another moment, Kate being able to pick the lock on her cuffs with a broken turn signal stick. We have seen this sort of crap before, and it was stupid then and it's stupid now. That's not how locks work. Ask your local locksmith. Kate's bike being where they held Kate hostage. Okay, Mouse captured Kate after a motorcycle accident. Why, why would they bother to bring the damaged motorbike to their crime scene? Then he just left it there in the street. More moments. Not being able to find Mouse. Okay. I said I spent 40 years in IT. Let me explain something to you, or for this show, allow me to mansplain something to you idiots about how cell phones work. Cell phones are at all times in contact with three cell phone towers. If they weren't, cell phones just couldn't work. All you have to do to find someone in a general area is to call the cell phone's carrier and have them tell you what towers the phone is connected to. You can't necessarily get an exact fix, but we'd give them a general area to search. And, <laughs> you know, a used car junkyard would be a damned good place to start, don't you think? Another one, the GCPD uh, putting up the, not putting up the bat signal, apparently because Batwoman came out of the closet. Look, I know you guys writing this crap think that this is like Saudi Arabia, where they throw gay people off of buildings to their death. And I know, I know, I get it, you know, I know coming out can be hard. It must be. I've never had to do it myself, but I can understand. But as one of the hostages said, this is 2020 and nobody really cares about this anymore. I certainly don't care. I don't know anyone who cares. I'm 55. I don't care. Nobody I know cares. This is just solely a political football where the idea of government-sponsored marriage, gay marriage, is an issue. But I have a really simple solution for that. Get government out of the marriage business entirely. There is no constitutional basis for the government to be involved in marriage in the first place. Get government out of it, and if you can find someone to perform a marriage, boom, you're married. Case closed. As long as you continue to petition government to do anything other than Get out of this marriage business completely. This will continue to be a political football. I could probably go on with the cringe moments, but what would be the point? It was just really, really stupid, just like usual. Now, I always try to mention in my reviews first, after I get done with the good and the bad, 
I always mention first the writers. And that's because without a script, you have nothing to shoot. Everything begins and ends with the script. Everything that happens, good or bad, is ultimately the fault of the writers. Now, I largely went over the writing in my okay and cringe moments. Again, the best you can say is that at least they didn't let off someone guilty of 450 counts of attempted murder, 7 million counts of extortion, and one count of credit card fraud simply because she was gay. The acting in this Ruby Rose, still a block of wood. She's either mad or she's smirking. Done and done. Rachel Scarston. It is interesting to see her do something over the, other than the over-the-top psychopath Alice. That'll come to an end, of course, when they inevitably kill off Beth. Megan Tandy. Well, she was okay with the soap opera drama. Out of place as it was. Otherwise, she's doing her best, I suppose, with the stupid that she has to play. One wonders what she'd be like with better material. Nicole Kang. Meh. Again, one wonders what she might be like if she were giving something other than stupid to play. Sam Littlefield. He's playing the same psychopathic monster he's always been playing. Again, one wonders what he'd be like if he were given something other than stupid to play. Everyone else was just kind of there. There really isn't much to say. Oh, except, of course, that the voice of disgraced journalist Rachel Maddow continues to be like fingernails on a chalkboard. One of the things you get into after short of after the script is stunts because they're usually a big deal on an action show like this. Oddly enough, INDB lists no stunt coordinator. And I my copy of it, of the episode that I got using the skills that I uh, got as a IT professional, didn't have commercials, but it also didn't show the end titles. So I wasn't able to see if the end titles were any different than IMDB. Sometimes they are. But whoever is in charge of coordinating these fights continues to, co to coordinate fights that are just impossible to follow. They need to work with the director more so they can follow what the hell is going on. Speaking of direction, the director was Merzi Almas. Every shot is darkly lit. Therefore, everything is hard or impossible to follow. It is just as simple as that. You got to do something besides dark, or no one will be able to follow this crap. The cinematographer. Well, again, IMDb lists no cinematographer, and my copy of the episode without the commercials also didn't show the end titles. There must be a cinematographer. The, sh the director's job is to decide what shots that they want, and then the cinematographer's job is to figure out the best way to get those shots. And in a perfect world, you have something of a collaboration between the cinematographer and the director. The director will say, I want these shots. The cinematographer will say, yeah, I can get those shots for you, but hey, what if we did this thing a little bit differently? You know, maybe that would make things look better. And the director will think about it and go, yeah, that would. And then they do something different, and, and it turns out better. I have no idea if that's happening here, but ultimately it doesn't matter. Everything is shot dark, so it's impossible to follow anything. Production designer. Once again, IMDb lists no production designer. My copy didn't. The episode didn't have the end credits. Um, everything was fine, and I'm sure the sets and locations would have looked better if they were shot in something other than damned near total darkness. The music is by Sherry Chung and Blake Neely. It is forgettable. It, underst it underscored the action. It was creepy where it needed to be. It added tension and emotion where dead silence would not have been as interesting. And that's what a good soundtrack should do. But will I remember this music? <laughs> nope. It is gone from my mind already, and it has been all of three hours since this film aired. Special effects. Once again, IMDb lists no special effects supervisor, and my copy didn't have the end credits. In fact, IMDb doesn't list anyone for any effects. And there must have been someone because they threw gas on a car and had it burst into flames. Somebody did that. 
And uh, they did it fine. And again, as I mentioned, at least they knew that the cars don't explode when they catch on fire. So that was good. Costume designer. Again, IMDb lists no costume designer. IMDb only lists a costume assistant, which isn't the same as the designer. Somebody, somebody designed what these characters are wearing. You see, good costumes always tell you something about the character. So for myself, I've said this in other videos, for myself, if you caught me on the street, I'd be wearing a t-shirt and jeans, or if I'm in the house like I am now, I'd be wearing a t-shirt and the jean shorts that I'm wearing under this. And that would tell you something about me as a person, the sort of clothes that I like to wear. Similarly, as I always say, uh, my old, late, great acting guru, Dr. William Morgan, stated, Theater is planned, rehearsed spontaneity. So, when you see anything in video, when you see anything on TV, it's all planned to some extent. So, the reason I'm wearing this Western-style vest, my white shirt, and my, you know, Indiana Jones hat, is because all of these things push an image of me. They contribute something about what I'm trying to do in terms of the brand of my show. So, costumes should always tell you something about the character. Now, Alice has been wearing the same exact thing uh, since episode one. Um, it's it, it, it has Kate, Luke, and Sophie. Now Alice's costume makes her look kind of crazy. Kate always looks as though she's butch and trying to look like a guy. And Luke is just in some sweater or tie all the time. And uh, Sophie wears a suit because that's basically the uniform of the crows. Well, somebody needs to tell the costumer that normal people like Kate and Luke don't constantly wear the exact same thing every single day. The makeup. Once again, IMDb lists no one for makeup. And my copy of the episode didn't show the end credits to see if it was any different. But somebody did makeup on this episode. I don't know who it was, but somebody did. You can't go in front of a camera without makeup, especially not in 1080p. The makeup is fine. I have no real complaints, nor is there anything amazing that jumps out at you, but I'm not sure there would be. There is one exception, and that's uh, for Rachel Scarson. It has been painfully obvious to me that she has been wearing wigs, both as Alice and as Beth. You can tell because her real hair sticks out in back. It makes, the, uh, it makes your wig poof out. That is a dead giveaway. Anytime you see the back of somebody's head poofing out a woman's, you're looking at somebody who's wearing a wig. Um, probably the only time that we actually have seen her real hair was when Beth was preparing to put that uh, wig on her. I think that was her real hair that was, you know, underneath a very tight hairnet and all that. Um, by the way, just a little bit of stupid here. Um, in the context of the show, where did they get a blonde wig that looks exactly like Alice's hair on short notice? Yeah. So at the end of any given review, we would ask ourselves, is it any good? No. Batwoman continues to be crap, as it has from episode one. The sole reason that I'm reviewing it, and immediately after Doctor Who, which makes my Sundays rather hectic and my back hurt, is that people who review this trash tend to get views. Well, I'm not above reviewing something just for the views. But it's still just crap. I have no idea how this show stays on the air other than maybe the CW is afraid of canceling a show with a gay main character and a lot of gay pathos for fear of pissing off a bajillion SJWs. Who knows? But at some point, the obviously terrible nature of this show will cause the um, 1.21 giga sponsors that I had to sit through to pull their ads and the CW will be forced to cancel it. That day cannot come soon enough. So this is a stupid tripe whose only purpose is to hammer home that gay people are either capable or shouldn't be held responsible for obviously criminal acts because they're gay. And that is all that I have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for this episode of the highly acclaimed, world-renowned Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone.
Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.